The next circuit solving technique we're going to talk about is branch current analysis. Before we jump into that, uh, there is one thing you should know about voltage and current sources, and that is that we can convert a current source to a voltage source or a voltage source to a current source um, if, we, if we need to. So that looks something like this. So we have a voltage source, say, uh, that is connected in series with a resistor, and it's connected to some, you know, to some other part of the circuit over there. Okay, so if this, um, if this voltage source has a value of E, E volts, and the resistor has a resistance of R, this, this part of our circuit, so if we imagine it's attached to, you know, the rest of our circuit at these two points, this is equivalent to a current source that is in parallel with a resistor connected between those same two points of our circuit, where this resistor value is the same and the value of the current here is equal to whatever this voltage is divided by that resistance. Going the other direction, if we started with this and wanted to convert to this, this voltage is equal to this current times that resistance. So this can be useful because the techniques we're about to, about to learn, or the next technique we're about to learn, requires us to have voltage sources only and not current sources. So if we had a current source that looks like this, we could convert it to this and then use this next technique for, for solving. Okay, branch current analysis. So the goal of these next techniques, um, rather than directly giving us values for the currents, the next techniques we're gonna learn give us a system of equations. So it's a, it's a kind of systematic way of applying Kirchhoff's laws to give us a system of equations that we can then solve with whatever our favorite system of equation solving technique is. Um, and that, you know, that solving process gives us the answers. Um, that's just math and we, you probably learned in linear algebra or something, there are, you know, 50 different ways to solve a system of linear equations. You can use matrices, you can solve for variables and plug them into each other. Um, yeah, uh, Kramer's rule. I feel like that's a thing. Anyway, um, but let's, let's talk about how we get those equations before we worry about that. Branch current analysis. The idea here is that we, we split our circuit into several different branches, each of which has a current flowing through it that we define, and then we, and then we analysis. Okay, so the rules, uh, the rules are this. First, like I just said, we have to convert all current to voltage sources because this is only going to work with voltage sources. Um, we, we assign a value of, of current or a variable for current in each, in each of the branches. So each branch gets a current I1, I2, you know, whatever you can name them, whatever you want. And then we do Kirchhoff's voltage law around each unique loop of our circuit. And I'll see right now, if you are drawing loops that include, if you draw loops, if you draw loops that entirely include paths included by other loops, those will not be unique. Um, those will not be unique loops. They will be, well, we'll explain later. They will be linearly dependent. They will not provide new information. But yeah, more on that once we have a picture. Uh, so Kirchhoff's logical law line around each loop. Um, and then we do Kirchhoff's current law at, um, at a junction. And for a lot of times you only need um, one of these for the size of circuits we're gonna do. Um, and this, um, 
This gives us a constraint on the values of i, and those are the same values of i that appear in these equations, and so these are what gives you this, this system of equations. Okay. As will often be the case here, I think this is better illustrated with an example. So let's see, we have a circuit that looks like this. Uh, yeah, this is good. So this is going to be another one with multiple sources. Uh, the branch current analysis and other techniques they work just fine if you have something with only one source. They will work for um, basically any circuit we're going to run into. Uh, so let's say this is 10 volts, and this is 15 volts, and this is 5 kilo ohms, 3 kilo ohms, and 10 kilo ohms. So we would like to know everything about this circuit, but it will be enough to find the current through every part of the circuit. So uh, the first thing we do is to split this into branches. So from like this point at the top, we have a few different branches of our circuit, right? We don't, you know, offhand we might not know if current's going to be going up or down, but you can only see there are three ways that current can get from the top of this picture to the bottom of the picture. So I'm going to switch colors before I start drawing too much on here. So we're going to assign, um, assign variables to this. And for this, we will have to guess the direction of the current. Um, it really doesn't matter if you guess wrong. That's just going to be off by a minus sign. But with enough of these, you can probably make educated guesses for at least most of the currents. Um, so this point is the most positive point in the circuit, right? Because this is 15 volts. So I'm going to at least say current is going to go like downhill from here. So it's going to be going up away from the plus 15 and going back to ground, you know, maybe that way. So one of my currents through this middle branch, I'm going to say is up and we're going to call that I, I'm going to be consistent with my notes here. So even though I did the, that first, we're going to call that I2. Um, I'm going to assume that the current in the left branch is also up, whether or not that's right doesn't really matter. Like I said, it's just a minus sign. We're going to call that I1, and I3 is going to be the current going down through this branch on the right. Okay, so we've defined the currents in our branches. Now we need to use Kirchhoff's uh, voltage law a few times. So first, let's do this loop on the left, starting here and going around like that. So this is gonna, this is messy, sorry, but we can at least still see what's going on. So going from here to here, uh, I'm increasing my potential by 10 volts. So I'm going up 10 volts, and then I'm going down some amount through the 10K resistor, and that is going to be equal to IR. So I have minus IR going across this resistor. That is minus I1 times 10K. So again, we're leaving these, ver these equations in terms of our unknown I1 variables because that is what we are ultimately going to solve for. So minus I1 times 10K. Uh, and here we are going in the opposite direction of I2, which means we must be going against the current in the 3K resistor, which means we must be increasing our potential. So this is going to be plus I2 times 3K. And now we're back to, oh, we're not back to where we started. We're right here. And so now we're going from the positive to the negative side of this 15 volts. And so we have minus 15. And we're back where we started. So that equals zero. Okay, so that's our first equation. Uh, now let's do this loop over here. So starting here and going, going clockwise around there. So now we have 
uh, 15 volts. We're increasing our potential by 15 volts and then decreasing by I2 times 3K. And then decreasing again by I3 times 5K, right? Uh, the current's flowing this way, so we must be decreasing our potential. Five k, and this also equals zero because we ended up back where we started. Okay, so those those application of Kirchhoff's law here has given us two linear equations, but these two equations have three unknowns, right? I one, I two, and I three. So we need some other piece of information, and that's going to come from Kirchhoff's current law. And we're going to do Kirchhoff's current law at we could we could pick. This point or this point, either one is going to give us um, the same answer. But let's look at what's going on here. So at this point, if we use the current law, the sum of the currents in equals the sum of the currents out. So the current in is equal to I1 and I2. And the current out is I3. So that is our third linear equation. Now we have three linear equations and three unknowns, so this is solvable by, again, your favorite linear algebra technique. Um, if you want to try this uh, on your own, I will just give you the answer. Um, I1 and I2 and I3 are all positive, um, and I got the following. I1 is equal to I, the, the exact solution, since I did it in Mathematica and got fractions, not decimals, is 1 19th of a milliamp. Yeah. I2 is equal to 35 nineteenths of a milliamp, and I3 is equal to uh, the sum of those two, which is 36 nineteenths of a milliamp. Um, yeah, so you, you could also plug these numbers into these equations and check and show that they satisfy that constraint. What we cannot do, uh, I think I can erase this now. I'll leave, actually I'll leave these two up. Uh, what we cannot do is try to get a third equation by the voltage law. So for example, you might say, oh, well there's another loop we didn't use, right? It's starting at the bottom, going around this one, going around, you know, over the top and down through the 5K resistor. Um, it turns out that that is not a linearly independent equation, meaning that is the equation that you get when you plug this equation into this equation. That doesn't give you any more information. That's just rearranging things with algebra. So in particular, um, this 3K and 15 volts appears in both of these equations. So it's like, substituting, you know, solving for this, so moving this to the other side, and then plugging this in for that, that is exactly the equation you get with this outside loop. So picking a loop that doesn't explore any new parts of your circuit doesn't give you any new information. Uh, you need to use the current law to relate these values of i to give you that extra bit of information.